cause is often unknown. We do know that people who have prolonged severe febrile seizures in infancy are much more likely to have temporal lobe epilepsy, but there are lots of other things as well that can increase the risk. Uh, traumatic brain injury, a brain infection like encephalitis or meningitis as a young child, uh, different kinds of uh, anatomical anomalies like dysplasia, uh, as well as things like tumors or strokes. Two thirds of patients with temporal lobe epilepsy have a history of having had febrile seizures as an infant, but most people who have febrile seizures will not go on to develop epilepsy later in life. Temporal lobe anatomy. So there are two main sections to the temporal lobe, the neocortex, which is the lateral and inferior parts of the temporal lobe, and then the mesial temporal lobe or medial, which is the central part of it. The temporal lobe as a whole plays a role in memory, language, visual, and sound processing. And the mesial portion of it is related to the limbic system with emotion and memory. So you'll have heard of Broca's area and Wernicke's area, which are areas that produce or comprehend speech, auditory cortex. That's all part of or related to the temporal lobe. There are certain uh, gyri and sulci, bumps and indents in the brain, in the temporal lobe that have certain names. So on the lateral aspect, the outer aspect of the temporal lobe, you've got the superior temporal gyrus, superior temporal sulcus, middle temporal gyrus, inferior temporal sulcus, and the inferior temporal gyrus. So the outside or lateral aspect of the temporal lobe is pretty simple. Once you go underneath and look at the inferior and mesial aspect of the temporal lobe, however, the, the anatomy gets very complicated. Everything starts to sort of curve together and it's very variable on each patient you'll have different sulci that do or don't connect uh, depending on that patient's anatomy. So as you curve underneath, you'll get down past the inferior temporal gyrus, you'll get the fusiform gyrus and the parahippocampal gyrus. And the parahippocampal gyrus as it comes farther back becomes the lingual gyrus posteriorly. And the sulci in between there, you'll have the occipitotemporal sulcus and the collateral sulcus. And as you look at the mesial aspect of the temporal lobe, you'll see where you have this collateral sulcus, and then you have your parahippocampal sulcus, which in some people is gonna be one long sulcus that you can actually see coming all the way back to the lingual, and other times you'll have uh, sulci in between, and it's not gonna be, I'm sorry, what gyrus, other times you'll have sulci in between and you won't be able to follow that gyrus all the way back. As you curve around inside of that mesial, the medial portion of the temporal lobe, you'll start seeing that the parahippocampal uh, gyrus comes up, then you have your hippocampal sulcus, then you have this dentate gyrus, which will come up to your fimbria. And your fimbria is what's gonna wrap all the way around and become part of the limbic system and the fornix. Then you have the uncus and the amygdala, which is basically wrapped up inside of the uncus. When you look at those mesial structures, you can see this is where the MCA comes out, very close to the amygdala and the uncus. That's where it's coming from the carotid cistern up to the sylvian fissure. And then this image is basically looking as if you're looking inside of the ventricle. So you've got your hippocampal head, which is the medial wall of the ventricle, the amygdala, which is basically the anterior wall of the ventricle, the collateral eminence, which is the other side of the collateral sulcus. So where the collateral sulcus here indents in, if you're looking at it from the bottom, when you're in the ventricle, it's then that tissue is gonna come up and form a bump within the ventricle called the collateral eminence. And you can see here, your fimbria is here and it comes all the way up to the fornix. So you've got your hippocampus, your dentate, your fimbria, and it comes around to the fornix. And that's sort of that main picture that people imagine when they think of the limbic system. So the blood supply to the temporal lobe comes from both anterior and posterior circulation. So your ICA comes up and gives off the anterior choroidal artery, which is gonna feed the anterior parahippocampal gyrus, the uncus, the amygdala. Then your MCA, your M1, branches into the anterior temporal artery and the temporal polar artery. Your uncle artery may come off of M1 or sometimes it comes off the anterior choroidal. And this is going to supply the anterior third or so of the superior, middle, and inferior temporal gyri, as well as the very anterior tip with the uncus and the anterior fusiform gyrus. Then your M2 branches are going to come and you're going to have anterior, middle, and posterior temporal arteries. And so you can see all these vessels reaching around that are coming from M1 and M2 around the lateral aspect of the temporal lobe. You also have your posterior circulation. So your PCA, which comes off of the vertebral basilar system, is then gonna branch off into multiple 
temporal arteries, including generally a temporal occipital artery. And some patients only have two or three, some will have four, you can have multiple vessels that come off and feed the inferior surface of the temporal lobe from the posterior circulation. Your venous drainage also goes to two different directions. So your lateral neocortex is gonna drain anteriorly to the superficial middle cerebral vein, then to the bay, which is also called the inferior anastomotic vein. And then that's gonna go down to the transverse sinus. Medially, the blood from the mesial temporal lobe, the hippocampus amygdala is gonna come down to the posterior choroidal vein. The posterior choroidal vein is gonna join with the thalamostriae and you're gonna get your internal cerebral vein. And the internal cerebral veins will then join with the basal veins of Rosenthal and they'll form the vein of Galen. So you have a basal vein of Rosenthal, your internal cerebral veins coming down together and you've got your vein of Galen, which then drains to the straight sinus. So we had a few minutes of talking about what epilepsy is and then a little bit about talking about the anatomy of the temporal lobe. Now I wanna talk a little bit about the management of patients with temporal lobe epilepsy and some of the treatment options for them. So who are candidates for epilepsy surgery? Not every patient with epilepsy is obviously gonna be a candidate for surgery. We really only think about surgery for patients who are medically refractory or intractable, people who have tried medications and are still having unacceptable seizure control. We also may consider surgery for people who have an obvious lesion, like if they have a tumor or a cavernous malformation or some obvious focal problem within the brain. But for people who don't have a visible obvious issue, we may still consider surgery for them if they're intractable. They've tried multiple medications, they're still having seizures, and their quality of life is really impaired due to the ongoing seizures. And if that's the case, then those patients really should be referred to a surgical epilepsy center. Once a patient comes to us, we then, as a team, will go through and try to figure out if this patient has a form of epilepsy, which is amenable to surgical treatment. Meaning do they have either a single epileptic focus that we can potentially take out, or do they have another specific form of epilepsy that we can treat without causing unacceptable impairment for the patient? So just like with everything in medicine, you start with the history and physical. You look at the patient, you talk to them, you talk to their family, what kind of seizures are they having, how often, can you figure out from the kind of seizures they're having, where they're beginning, how they progress, when did the seizures start, what other medications and therapies have they tried? How disabling are their seizures? How much of an impact is it having on them? If it's a more severe impact, you may be willing to try larger sur surgeries than if they're only having one seizure every few months and they're otherwise very functional. Neurologic deficits, what kind of deficits do they have? Are they having cognitive delays or difficulties because of their epilepsy? Temporal lobe epilepsy, will often have focal aware seizures. These are again, what we mentioned as simple partial seizures without loss of awareness, or they may have focal impaired awareness seizures, which are what used to be called the complex partial seizures. Many temporal lobe seizures will also begin with an aura. People used to think of the aura as something separate from the seizure, but now we actually think it is a form of focal aware seizure for most patients. The aura can be a sensation. It can be hard to describe for a lot of patients. It can be a sensation of deja vu, a uh, sensation of fear or even joy for some patients. It can be a strange odor or taste, or it can be a rising sensation in the abdomen. And patients will describe it, it kind of feels like when you're on the top of a roller coaster and you feel like everything's lifting up, it kind of has that sensation. Um, and that is actually a focal aware seizure, which can sometimes precede a larger focal impaired awareness seizure. EEGs are very important, electroencephalograms. This is where we actually try to see what the electrical activity is going on in the brain during a seizure. Interictal means between seizures. So if you're just doing a spot EEG, you know, 20, 30 minute EEG, you're probably gonna be between seizures for most patients. And at that point, you're gonna look and see where the electrical activity looks abnormal. You may not see an actual seizure, but you may see spikes. You may see abnormal activity that can suggest where in the brain it's coming from. Medial temporal lobe epilepsy will often have interictal discharges from the anterior temporal lobe, potentially even bilaterally. An ictal EEG means you've caught an EEG during a seizure, and that can be very helpful in showing where seizures are starting. It may not be specific to a small area, but it can at least show you a region of the brain where the seizures are starting. Video EEG monitoring is, is very useful in that we keep patients in the hospital for a couple of days in order to make sure we capture multiple seizures and we have them on video so you can actually see what their body is doing when the seizure starts on the EEG and you can really correlate it 
and look for a consistent area of seizure onset at the very beginning of the seizure before it spreads elsewhere in the brain. Imaging is also very important to help us see if we can treat someone's epilepsy. We look for an abnormality on the MRI that concurs with the EEG findings. If there is a focal abnormality on the MRI that lines up with the EEG findings, we have a much better chance at surgical cure for most patients. For temporal lobe epilepsy, over time, repeated temporal lobe seizures can actually make the hippocampus, that middle part of the temporal lobe, start to atrophy or shrink. It loses neurons. This is something called hippocampal sclerosis. And on this image, you can see that the left hippocampus is sort of this nice little S shape, the, the little seahorse shape. And on the right side, it looks much smaller. It's got sort of different coloring. The ventricle around it looks a lot larger because the tissue itself is smaller. That's right hippocampal sclerosis. That tells you that that side of the brain has likely been exposed to seizures frequently over time. Functional imaging can help as well especially if someone isn't having an obvious temporal lobe seizure where the semiology, the EEG, everything lines up with obvious mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. Sometimes it's lateral temporal epilepsy or farther back, more, more posterior temporal epilepsy. And you don't necessarily see that stereotypical pattern on EEG and MRI. And then functional imaging, like a PET scan, for instance, can be very helpful. A PET scan will use metabolism to try to detect epileptic focus. You inject radio label glucose, glucose into, uh, in, in, and then you watch in a patient, you inject a patient with the radio labeled glucose interictally, and you watch and see which areas of the brain have a lower metabolism. Usually this is not going to be captured during a seizure where the metabolism would be very high. Instead, it's going to be interictal when the metabolism is low. And in this patient, for instance, you can see it in this left temporal, parietal, and even some of the occipital area, it's a yellowish color instead of the bright red that it is on the other side that tells you it's a lower metabolism over here. So that's a suggestion, not a definite, but a suggestion that seizures may be coming from that area because that area of the brain is abnormal. There are other tests that we do as well. Neuropsychological testing can be very helpful in terms of helping us assess a patient's preoperative function. A WADA test is helpful in temporal lobe epilepsy because it can help us figure out if a patient has good function in their hippocampus and their mesial temporal structures. So with a WADA test, you essentially temporarily put one hemisphere of the brain to sleep. So you inject amabarbital, a barbiturate, and it's done with the cerebrovascular surgeons injecting everything very carefully to make sure that we're just putting it in half of the brain. And by putting half of the brain, one temporal lobe to sleep, you can see what the other temporal lobe is able to do. So you can see if you're thinking about potentially taking out one, one temporal lobe hippocampus. Before you do that, you wanna make sure that the other side is capable of retaining the patient's memory and speech. So the water test can help you figure out sort of what would happen if I took this tissue out, how would the patient look? Are they safe if I were to take this side out? So once we've gotten all of our information, our EEGs, our MRIs and other imaging, medical history and exams and all of that, then as a team, we discuss what we should do next. Epileptologists, neurosurgeons, neuropsychologists, neuroradiologists, the um, nurse clinicians who've been working with the patients, all of us get together and we discuss what's really the best option for this particular patient and this particular family. Sometimes we can go on to a therapeutic surgery, which I'll talk about in a moment. Other times we need a diagnostic surgery first. And I'll discuss that as well before I talk about the therapeutic surgeries. Prior to actually offering surgery for a patient, we do want to make sure that they've had non-surgical therapies as well. So this is obviously the anti-epileptic medications. Sometimes if anti-epileptic medications alone aren't enough, sometimes the neurologist will offer ketogenic diet, which is where you have a very low carbohydrate, high fat diet that makes the body mimic starvation. It creates ketosis in the body. This is a very difficult diet to stay on for a long period of time since it really takes a real commitment and it often takes the whole family to commit to it because if other people at the dinner table are eating other foods, the patient's gonna want that too. Um, but it can be very effective for the correct patients. If they're able to stay on it for at least three months, it can decrease seizures by 50% or more in half the patients. If we've tried medications, dietary changes, lifestyle modifications, and someone is still having seizures, then we're gonna go on to talk about different surgical options for them. The diagnostic surgery 
that we may sometimes offer for a patient is an intracranial EEG. If we're not sure where the seizures are coming from, if we're not sure if it's coming from one hippocampus or both, if we don't know if it's coming from the mesial or lateral temporal lobe, or if we think the seizures are starting in say the left temporal lobe, but we're afraid it might be right near their speech area or other eloquent cortex, meaning really important part of the brain that you can't take out. Then we may wanna put EEG leads on the brain or even deep in the brain before we're willing to take anything out. So this is surgically inserted EEG electrodes. We can implant electrodes on the surface or deep in the brain, watch the patient with a video EEG in the hospital for a couple of days or even a couple of weeks if necessary, and then go on to see how we can offer them a therapeutic surgery. So there's two ways to do intracranial electrodes, subdural electrodes or depth electrodes. Subdural electrodes, as the name suggests, are below the dura. So they're on the surface of the brain. This is a craniotomy. You open up the dura and you lay the grids directly on the surface of the brain. They come in all different shapes and sizes. Some of them are thin strips. So you can place them interhemispheric or underneath the temporal lobe, so temporally. Um, and others are larger, so you can cover large areas of the brain. And then we can register where we have the electrodes. We get a post-op image, and then we register that to the MRI so we can see exactly where the electrodes are. We can see them all subtemporally laying on you know, the temporal and frontal area over the sylvian fissure, wherever it is that we need to monitor. This is very helpful, especially if someone, for instance, has left temporal lobe seizures. We know it's right near the eloquent cortex or speech area. Then we can go through, we can put grids or subdural electrodes directly on the surface of the brain. And in addition to watching their seizures to see exactly where the seizures are starting much more specifically than with the scalp EEG, we can also do language mapping. So we can go through and stimulate each of the electrodes on that grid and see where we're messing up someone's speech. So if I'm stimulating these electrodes and someone is able to talk without any difficulty, I know that that's an area of the brain that's not involved directly or necessarily in their speech. However, if I'm stimulating areas and someone is no longer able to name things that they're looking at, if you're showing them a picture and they can't say, this is a candle, this is a fork, instead they, they can't talk or they can't say exactly what it is, then I know that that's an area of the brain that they are using for their language, for their visual naming or auditory naming. And therefore I cannot take that area out. And so putting subdural grids on is very helpful for language mapping as well as motor mapping and other the finding eloquent cortex. Subdural grids have some great advantages surgically over the depth electrodes. Because it's done as a craniotomy where you're opening up the brain and looking directly at the surface. If I were to see any bleeding, I'd be able to stop it. I get great coverage superficially. It's nice to see where the electrodes are located when during a resection. So for instance, if we know that the seizures are coming from an area in the center here. The neurologists give me the exact numbers. You can go through when you take the grids off and actually mark out on the brain exactly where that area is that the seizures are coming from and then resect right there at that same setting. So you know for sure you're taking out exactly the area that you were trying to take out from your EEG. And like we discussed, it permits functional mapping. Disadvantages are that it's harder to cover deep or mesial tissue. You can slide some electrodes under the temporal lobe or between the two hemispheres, but you're not really getting deep into the brain. It's harder to map bilaterally. If you think someone's seizures may be coming from both temporal lobes or both hippocampi, it's harder to do a large craniotomy on both sides of the brain. That'd be very uncomfortable for a patient. Plus there's some risk of bleeding and infection, about a 4% risk of bleeding, although often it's not clinically symptomatic. You see it on the post-op imaging and it, you can often just let it absorb on its own if it's a small amount as well as some small risk of infection, uh, spinal fluid leak, and often patients have headaches. This is a relatively large surgery. They'll often have some headaches and some nausea while the electrodes are in place. So if we don't need to map out the surface of the brain, oftentimes instead we can do depth electrodes. This is placed through something called a stereotactic EEG or stereo EEG. For this, we can actually place depth electrodes down into the hippocampus or into deep areas of the brain. These are these thin little 1.1 millimeter electrodes and you can get very good deep coverage throughout the temporal lobe or throughout anywhere else in the brain. So this is targeted stereotactic, like really detailed GPS down to a fraction of a millimeter, targeted placement of depth electrodes within the parenchyma without needing a craniotomy. So as you can see here, you just make a very small cut in the scalp, the patient is still asleep in surgery, very small cut in the scalp. Then you drill a two and a half millimeter opening through the skull screw these little bolts in place that have an opening and you slide the one millimeter electrode right through it, tighten it down, and then you have these electrodes that you can then monitor someone's seizures. 
Um, you can actually place more than 20 electrodes. 20 or more can be placed in some patients. They can stay in for about two weeks and replace them using robotic assistance to make sure that they're very accurate. So ahead of time, the neurologist will tell me what sections of the brain they're interested in. I'll go through on the MRI and draw out a plan of exactly where I wanna place each of the electrodes to make sure we capture each of the areas that we need to study. Then you register that to this robotic assistant. And in the OR, this robotic arm will then line up exactly where I've made that plan. And then you can place the electrodes directly through that robotic arm and it lines up with what we've planned on the MRI ahead of time. And that way we can be very specific, very accurate, avoid the blood vessels, avoid certain parts of eloquent cortex, avoid the ventricles, and put the electrodes where we need them in order to monitor someone's seizures. The neurologists get an EEG, just like they do with a scalp EEG, but a lot more detailed. And they can go through and tell us where the seizures are starting. Stereo EEG has some great advantages over depth electrodes. You get good three-dimensional mapping, great coverage of deep tissue, smaller complication rate, you're not doing a large craniotomy, so it's only about a one to 3% risk of hemorrhage or infection. With the robotic assistant, we can place them very accurately, much more so than we could when we used to place them with the, uh, some of the frameless or frame techniques. Patients tolerate it very well with essentially no increase in intracranial pressure. They usually have a headache the first night after it's placed, mostly from little cuts in the temporalis muscle. After that, they're usually feeling fine and just sort of bored sitting in the hospital waiting for seizures. The disadvantage is, is that you don't get good coverage of the superficial cortex, so it's harder to map out that area. It's harder to find the border between your seizure focus and your eloquent tissue, uh, or to really map your language or motor function. And if you were to have any bleeding from placing these, even though the risk is small, it's not zero, if you were to have any bleeding from placing them, you wouldn't be able to see or control that bleeding easily. So you always have to get a CAT scan after you place them to see if there is any blood that you have to worry about. And it's a little bit harder to do this on the small babies, we have done it down to about 14 months. A lot of places will stop at about two because you really have to be very careful placing them in through the, a thin skull. Both subdural and SEEG can allow us to get a really good idea of where someone's seizures are coming from. And depending on exactly where they're located, you can have a lot of patients who are seizure free if you can find their seizure focus. Once we do the intracranial EEG and we figure out where someone's seizures are coming from, then we go on to the therapeutic surgeries. So one of the common ones is called a lesionectomy. So if someone like this patient, for instance, this patient has a visible mass and abnormality on the MRI. So this is the left temporal lobe. You see these little white circles here. This is a cystic lesion. That's a common uh, lesion that causes epilepsy or seizures. It looks like it's consistent with something called a DNET or dysembryoplastic neuroepithelial tumor. It's a very benign, lesion, but it can cause seizures. And so if someone has a focus like that, then we can often just do a lesionectomy. You can go in and take that out. Sometimes the resection is limited to the lesion. Sometimes you need to take some of the tissue around it as well, because the border where the lesion touches the brain can sometimes be epileptogenic. So if there's a well-demarcated lesion on MRI that matches up with the EEG and seizure semiology, and it's not an eloquent cortex, then you can often skip the intracranial electrodes and just take out the lesion. But if the lesion on MRI has borders that you really don't know where the end of it is, you don't know for sure where you would stop a resection, or if it overlaps with or abuts eloquent territory, then you're gonna do the intracranial electrodes before you do the lesionectomy. So one patient, for instance, a 12 year old male came in with epilepsy, MRI showed a right temporal parietal mass that looked like a dysplasia. Dysplasia is where the neurons don't really line up appropriately. It's sort of disorganized brain. We placed depth electrodes on the right side of his brain because his EEG showed it was sort of a broader area than just where his lesion was. His lesion was visible in the right temporal parietal area, but that whole side potentially was causing seizures on a scalp EEG. So we needed to know where do we need to reset? Sometimes a dysplasia, what you see on MRI is just the tip of the iceberg. Sometimes it's really a broader area that's abnormal than just that one thing you can see on MRI. So we put depth electrodes in around that area on the right side of his brain, monitored him for a week in the ICU with the electrodes. We were able to find the seizure focus, which was both at and surrounding the MRI abnormality. Took him to surgery, took that area out with the lesionectomy and an epileptic focus resection. And he's been seizure free for 10, more than 10 months now since the surgery. If someone has 
the hippocampal sclerosis we were talking about or obvious mesial temporal lobe uh, seizures. Then there are a few different kinds of surgeries you can do that offer a very nice chance of seizure freedom. So if there's seizure semiology, the imaging, everything is consistent with mesial temporal lobe surgery, uh, mesial temporal lobe epilepsy, then you can offer an anterior temporal lobectomy where you actually take out that whole anterior portion of the temporal lobe. This it has a very high chance at surgical cure for correctly selected patients. More than 75% of patients will be free of disabling seizures if their seizures are coming from the temporal lobe. However, you're taking out a decent amount of tissue. There are risks of visual field deficits, memory deficits. Um, so sometimes we'll do a, a smaller resection. Sometimes we'll just do a selective amygdala hippocampectomy. So for this, instead of taking out that lateral tissue, you can leave that lateral tissue, travel through it, and just take out that mesial tissue. This has decreased risks, but may decrease the percent chance of seizure freedom as well. We also sometimes, I'll talk a bit in a minute about laser amygdala hippocampectomy, where you can actually burn that area without even having to do a craniotomy to take it out. Temporal lobectomy is one of the few things in neurosurgery that we actually have good randomized controlled trials for. In 2001, there was a terrific study done in Canada, 80 patients with temporal lobe epilepsy who were deemed to be surgical candidates were assigned to either medication for a year or temporal lobe surgery immediately. At one year out, 58% of the patients in the surgical group were free of disabling seizures called angle one classification versus only 8% in the medical group. And this was 20 years ago. We have better data now. So even 20 years ago, quality of life was improved in the surgical group and more than half of them were seizure free. Now that we have better MRIs, better surgical techniques, the studies usually say 75 to 80% of patients, correctly selected patients can be seizure free after temporal lobectomy. In one study with 1300 patients uh, by a meta-analysis of multiple studies, uh, they were able to see Engel class one means free of disabling seizures in 76% of patients in this meta-analysis. So temporal lobectomy can be very satisfying for a surgeon. If you know someone has mesial temporal lobe epilepsy, it's coming from their hippocampus. You don't think it's coming from the lateral tissue. They've got temporal sclerosis, something that looks like it's just that little area. Or if they have some other lesion where you can actually see on an MRI where that well demarcated lesion is and it's relatively small, then sometimes you don't have to do the open surgery. Instead, you can do a laser ablation. This is MRI guided controlled burn or ablation of the tissue. So you can make a small incision in the scalp, feed the laser catheter down under MRI guidance and stereotaxis to your target. The lasers, there's two main brands, Visualase and Neuroblate. They both work by having a cooling system so you can easily control. They have a laser that heats up and a cooling system that cools it down so you can easily control the temperature. You could use MR thermography where you can actually monitor the temperature at certain areas of the brain, both in your target tissue that you want to heat up and surrounding it in areas that you don't want to damage. And you can actually in real time in MRI guidance, watch yourself heat up and burn your target. This is a very good option if patients have a well demarcated MRI visible lesion, you have to be able to see what you're targeting on MRI or a depth electrode confirmed target. So if you stuck stereo EEG electrodes in and you found a couple of them that show you an obvious area that's causing the seizures, you can use that as your demarcation border. But you have to have some way of saying, okay, this is as far as I'm gonna go on the MRI. And this can be used for mesial temporal sclerosis, for tumors, hypothalamic hamartomas or a deep tumor that it's wonderful surgery for. Uh, there's a, a lot of different pathologies that you can use this laser ablation for. So this is what the, cath the fiber catheters look like. It's just a three millimeter incision. You place the laser catheter down, screw it down temporarily into the skull, bring the patient into the MRI scanner, verify the location of your catheter to make sure it's exactly where you wanted it to be. Heat up the MRI, watch the lesion burn and ablate to the point where you know those cells will die while you're making sure that the surrounding tissue stays safe. And patients usually go home one or two days afterwards. There's only a three millimeter cut, so there's not significant pain. You do have to give them some steroids because the tissue that you burned will swell, uh, but you can get a very good uh, ablation. You can really treat small targets well without having to do a large open resection. But the chances of seizure freedom are slightly lower as well because you are taking out or burning less tissue than you are with the open surgery. Oops, this is coming in stages. 
So this is one patient. We had a teenage male with intractable epilepsy. And you can see that his right hippocampus looks nice and full and round. And the left one looks smaller. You can see more ventricle around it. And this is consistent with left mesial temporal sclerosis. So we took him for laser ablation, put the catheter in. You check before you burn anything to make sure that it's in a good position within the hippocampus. Then intraoperatively, you burn in stages for the hippocampus because it's long and thin. You burn a small amount, then you pull the catheter back, you burn again, you pull it back, you burn again until you feel like you have enough tissue. And you can see the outline of exactly where you're ablating. And during surgery, you can see the temperature all around it. You can see the temperature in the brainstem and spinal fluid is a good heat sink. So it doesn't tend to heat up past here. So you can check the temperature in the brainstem and cerebellum the whole time to make sure you're not burning tissue you don't want to burn. And six week post-op, you get your scan and you see that that tissue has been burned exactly where you intended to burn it. And this patient was seizure free for more than a year after surgery for the first time in his life. So laser amygdala hippocampectomy has some great results for temporal lobe epilepsy. There are studies that have shown that you can have significant seizure reduction. For patients with mesial temporal sclerosis, 67% of them were seizure free. And more than half of patients were free of disabling seizures even if they didn't have mesial temporal sclerosis. So these numbers aren't quite as good as the 75 to 80% that you'll have with open surgery, but it's a three millimeter cut with a tiny laser and no craniotomy. So for a lot of patients, it's really a very good option. For neurocognitive function, it's also wonderful because you're taking out less tissue and you're not going through all of that lateral cortex, you're less likely to have cognitive declines. Generally, the cognitive declines will be very minimal for most patients. However, when you do actually do studies, you can see that there is some measurable decline in the majority of patients who have open resection. In this particular study, none of the 19 patients who had the laser amygdala hippocampectomy had declines in uh, recognizing famous faces, saying common nouns, some of the different studies that you can do, tests you can do to test temporal lobe function. Whereas more than 80% of the patients in the open resection group had at least mild declines in one or both measures. Sometimes someone's seizures are coming from both hippocampus or coming from both temporal lobes in general, or it's coming from eloquent tissue. It's coming from where their language is located. So you can't take it out. In that case, we may say, well, let's stimulate it instead. So there's two main ways to stimulate or modulate, try to change the neural pathways via stimulation over time if we can't take out or burn that tissue. Vagal nerve stimulation and responsive neurostimulation are the two main that are being used. DBS or deep brain stimulation is still in studies, but that may eventually become a treatment for epilepsy as well. So vagal nerve stimulation is placing a stimulator in the chest with electrodes that are wrapped around a nerve in the neck. It can be programmed to send an electrical signal every few minutes that goes up to the brain. And over time, it seems to reorganize neural pathways by sending this electrical stimulation up to the brain. The side effects are generally rather small, vocal cord dysfunction or hoarseness that are usually transient. It's an outpatient surgery. It just takes an hour and patients can go home that same day. And it's FDA approved for kids foreign uh, older, although we do use it off label in younger kids. Stimulation, both the VNS and the RNS that I'll mention in a moment are generally not gonna be curative. These are usually both considered palliative surgeries. So temporal lobe, uh, lobectomies or amygdala hippocampectomies has, have a good chance at actually curing or stopping someone's seizures, making them free of disabling seizures. The VNS or RNS are much less likely to do that. So they're used only if you don't have something you can resect or ablate, but they can still significantly improve quality of life and significantly reduce the number of seizures. So they're a very good option if someone doesn't really have a real curative option that's an, a, a decent option for them. So both kinds of stimulators will improve over time as they slowly change the neural networks. So the VNS, about 50% of patients will have a 50% reduction in seizures within a year. So it does get better over time. In a 2011 study, there was about a 35% seizure reduction once it had been in for six months and a 65% seizure reduction once it had been for five or six years. And one of the nice things about VNS is that once it's been in for two years, it decreases the risk of SUDEP or sudden unexpected death from epilepsy. And even if someone is, is still having some seizures, you can still significantly decrease that risk, which obviously is, is a good benefit. And it does continue to improve over time and you can often get an AED reduction. It also can, as, as this is an anti-epileptic medicine, seizure medicine reduction over time. 
It also can improve mood and alertness. The same device is also FDA approved for adults with depression in addition to people who have epilepsy. So one of the nice side effects from it is it can improve uh, alertness or mood for some patients. But it's generally not going to be a cure. Only 5% of patients will be seizure-free with the VNS. The rest of them will still need some seizure medications um, or still have some seizures, even if they're having fewer. The RNS is another nice stimulator option. This is actually implanted in the skull. So this generator is sort of a little computer that continuously reads EEG. You can place depth electrodes directly into your bilateral hippocampi, or you can place it directly on the surface of the temporal lobe on top of eloquent tissue that you can't resect safely. Anywhere your seizures are coming from, you can actually stimulate directly there in order to not only read an EEG from there 24 seven on this little computer, but also to stimulate whenever it sees a seizure. So the neurologist will program this device and the patient will download information from it every day or every couple days. And the neurologist can take that information and change exactly which electrodes are being programmed and how in order to try to get the best possible seizure control. Again, this is palliative, not curative, but you can have significant seizure reduction. And again, the results improve over time. Once it's been in for about two years, you have more than 53% or more than 50% seizure reduction. And 13% of the patients in the study had a seizure-free period of one year or more, which for these patients, you know, is huge improvement in quality of life. Most of these patients are seizing, you know, either every day or several times a week. So to be able to go a few months or a year seizure-free is huge. Um, so again, it's not going to be a cure for most patients, but some of them can have a long-term period of, of seizure freedom. And the others, even if they're not seizure free for any period of time can still have significant reduction in seizures. So how do we choose? Well, how are we gonna treat a patient? It's really based on each individual patient and their family. Uh, every patient is gonna have you know, different anatomy, different pathology uh, and different risks and benefits of each individual surgery. So it really has to be done as a team approach including the patient and their family. Here's a bunch of different references. Um, so on the online version, uh, you guys can look at these and see if there's any different articles that are interesting to you. Thank you very much for your time. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you liked that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.